Good morning, my name is Kay Edward Copeland and I wanna welcome you to another online worship experience here at New Zion Baptist Church. Today we're going to be preaching from Colossians chapter three verses 12 through 17. So I invite you to get your Bible or whatever apparatus you use in order to access the scripture and join us as you hear the scripture read in your hearing. And after the reading of the scripture, I'm going to preach from this title, The Dress Code for Christians. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. The dress code for Christians. When I was growing up, I lived in a church culture where Sunday morning dress was extremely important. We put on the best that we had. As a matter of fact, you couldn't wear your Sunday clothes except on Sunday. And then as soon as you got home from church, you had to pull off those Sunday clothes lest you get them messed up. The young ladies had to wear dresses. You couldn't wear pants uh, to church in the culture that I grew up in. And the young men had to wear ties and white shirts. Over the years, I've interacted with various other church cultures and have found that various other church communities view dressing up for church differently. As a matter of fact, I'll never forget, I went to one church in Oakland, California, where I was the guest speaker for a series of sermons. First night I showed up, I had on my shirt and tie and um, was wondering why I was received a certain way. But then after the service, the pastor let me know, in this neighborhood, you're not gonna be heard wearing what you're wearing because everybody else was dressed down. So the next night I had to come in with something else. The truth of the matter is, when we talk about physical dress, fashions go in and out and different cultures view certain articles of clothing and certain formal or informal ways of dressing a particular way. But the real question is, what's the real dress code for Christians? Can somebody determine you're a Christian by how you're dressed? Well, let me show my hand. The real fashion sense of a Christian is not based upon how long your skirt is, what, what color your shirt is, or how whether you wear a tie or not. The real ultimate dress code of a Christian has to do with the habits and attitudes that we put on to reflect the true character of Christ. I believe that's what this text is getting at today here in Colossians, what the real dress code for Christians is. You'll remember the context of chapter three. Paul has been arguing, uh, starting at the beginning of this chapter, about how we are to meditate constantly and mortify consistently how we're to meditate on where we're going, setting our affections, setting our hearts on Christ and setting our sights on our ultimate destiny. And at the same time, we are to be continually putting to death certain things. Why? Because we've been raised with Christ and the resurrection lifestyle has certain imperatives with it. And so toward the end of uh, chapter 10 of verse, pardon me, chapter three, verse 10 and 11, he talks about, how we have put off the old self and we've put on the new self. And he picks up here in verse 12 to talk about, so those who've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, we ought to put on certain things. So if you just look at the text on your tablet or in your Bible, you'll notice that this text divides up equally in two separate parts. Verses 12 through 14, he's going to talk about certain things that we need to put on and then in verses 15 through 17, 
He's going to talk about ways that we ought to interact, how we are to live this lifestyle. Now, because we have been raised up with Christ, we need to put certain things on, he says in verses 12 through 14. Look at what he says here. Put on, verse 12, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should. So what are the elements in this holy haberdashery? What, what is the wardrobe of the redeemed? What does it look like? Well, let me back up and point out something. Before you put on the new, you have to make sure that you take off the old. What I'm getting ready to describe right now is for those who have been raised with Christ because you died with him to your old way of life. In other words, these things that I'm going to describe, they're not moralisms. They're not things that if you do this, then you'll be right with God. No, this is is the wardrobe of those who have already received Christ, those who've been bought by the blood of the lamb, those who have died to the elementary principles of this world, and those who have been raised up with Christ. It's just like in John chapter 11, when Jesus rose, resurrected, when Jesus resuscitated or raised from the dead, his friend Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, he had his grave clothes on, but once he was raised up and he came forward from the tomb, Jesus said, Hey, lose him and let him go. In other words, get those grave clothes off of him. So if you're listening and listening and you've never opened up your heart to receive the love of Jesus Christ, I need you to understand that what we're talking about is the lifestyle of those who've made that commitment. And I pray that you will make that commitment today, that you will allow him to mortify all the things in your life that have kept you from being in fellowship with God and that you would allow him to raise you up because the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is simply this, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved, or in other words, delivered. But to you, brother and sister, saint, if you are saved, if you have been raised up, if you have been delivered, this is your wardrobe. This is what we are affirmatively, not passively, what we have to intentionally put on. A heart of compassion. This has to do with being tenderhearted, uh, a kind heart. This has to do with this idea of reaching out to others, uh, not just with compassion, that is sympathy and empathy, but reaching out to them to do good to them, even if they don't deserve it. This idea of humility, uh, being lowly, that is not filled with pride, not overbearing. This idea of gentleness and patience, gentleness, that idea or meekness, some translation says, it's power under control. It's just like a wild animal that has been tamed, that you have tamed your heart and you know how to deal in meekness, in gentleness with other people. And you have a, a long temper, verse 12 at the end when it says, and patience, an old translation that might say long suffering, it's the idea of having a long fuse. As Christians, this is our holy haberdashery. This is what we're to wear. And you'll notice that all of these things very accurately reflect the image of Christ. And who wouldn't want to be around someone who displays these characteristics? But he goes forward with this wardrobe, not just these five things that strangely enough seem to counteract the things that he had talked about earlier in chapter in chapter three, verse five, as well as in chapter three, verse eight, those things that are anti-God, uh, those things that caught, get us caught up in sensual sins as well as social sins. But he goes on in verse 13 to talk about that we have to learn how to bear with one another and forgive each other. That is, we have to learn how to live in community and, and learn how not to push ourselves forward but at the same time, we have to learn how to let go. If you have a complaint, if you have some ought against your brother, this text is teaching that what makes us identifiable to the world is this holy attire of forgiveness, the ability to let go of a complaint, let go of the need for revenge 
or let go for the, of the need for retaliation. But notice the impetus for this. I'm looking at verse 13. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. In other words, this is again for the redeemed. See, th these things are hard to do unless you've been raised from the dead. He, he's saying that you only have to forgive others as Christ has forgiven you. So now, if you don't, <laughs> if he hadn't forgiven you, then this maybe doesn't apply to you. But if you have been forgiven, you have no right to hold on to something that somebody else has done when God has forgiven you of that and more. This text is teaching us that as Christians, we have to put on these holy habits and attitudes that reflect God's character. But notice in verse 14, just like any outfit, you need something that ties it all together. Verse 14 says, it's love. Love is the perfect bond of unity, or it's the bond of perfect unity. Various ways you can translate it, but bottom line is all of this boils down to love because love is compassionate, love is kind, love is humble, love is gentle, and love is patient, and love bears all things. This idea of love pulling us together, not just as individuals, but within community, we show the beauty of Christ when we learn how to coordinate our clothes. So it, it shouldn't be gentleness plus greed or humility plus hubris. You got to take off the old stuff and put on the new stuff. This is the wardrobe of the believed, of the redeemed. And what I like about it, it fits all sizes and it never goes out of style. But notice what else? Once you put on these things, what are you supposed to do? Where are you supposed to go? It's a tragedy to get all dressed up and you don't, got, you don't have any place to go. Look at what he says here in verses 15 through 17 with these various imperatives. In other words, since we've been raised with Christ and since we've taken off the old man and put on the new man, this new man who is manifested in compassion and gentleness and humility and all these things and the ability to forbear and to forgive one another, what else are we supposed to do? Look at verse 15 through 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. In other words, be the referee in your heart to which you were called into one body. Now notice what he's saying, that we, are to, we ought to have peace in our heart and peace in community with one another. The reason that we don't have one is because we don't have the other. Listen carefully. The, the reason that very often in community, whether it be in the church or whether it be in the family or whether it even be out in society, the reason that we don't have peace with one another, we don't have peace with him individually. But this text is teaching us that if you're going to live this resurrection life, here's what this dress code requires, and that is that you learn how to let the peace of God, the peace of Christ, be the referee in your heart to let you know what's out of bounds and what's in bounds. And not just in your heart, but within relationships, within community, we're supposed to let the peace that only Christ can provide be the thing that keeps us in bounds with one another. Oh, how we need this word, word today in today's world. We, we need to learn how to live in shalom, how to live in peace. Peace is not just the absence of conflict. Peace is the harmonious working together, interdependence of everything that God has created in the way that he designed it to create. And if you want peace in your family, it starts, first of all, with you. Do you have the peace of Christ in your heart? And then you can pray. Learn how to forgive, learn how to be gentle, kind, and all these other things that we've already talked about putting on. And God will help peace to rule in your home, in your church, and yes, even society. In verse 15, he says, it's not just peace in your heart and peace in the community, but that peace will turn into praise. Look at verse 15 and be thankful at the end of verse 15. Literally, when you have peace in your heart, there'll be praise on your lips. When you got peace in your heart, it doesn't matter even if you 
find yourself strictured and if you find yourself hampered in terms of your mobility, you'll still have praise on your lips. How do I know that? Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas got thrown in prison, but they had so much peace in their hearts that while they were in the stockade, while they were in the dungeon, they sang hymns of praise unto the Lord. The, the prisoners around them heard it and even God himself heard it to the extent that he shook the building and shook all of their shackles off. All I'm trying to say is, if you let peace rule in your heart, there'll be praise on your lips. And this text is teaching us that if we have been redeemed, that peace is something that we have to pursue as well as gratitude. Be thankful, be continually developing an attitude of gratitude. But not only that, look at verse 16. Not just peace, but let the word of Christ be at home in you ritually. And notice what he's saying here, that when the word takes precedence in your life, when you hide God's word in your heart so that you don't sin against him, when you let, when you abide in his word so that his word can abide in you, then what will happen is it will be contagious. You'll start, according to this text, you'll learn how to teach and admonish others in community with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The, the idea is that as that what's in you is going to come out of you. If you eat <laughs> gyros and funyuns, you, you're not going to burp up peaches. But if you whatever you eat, that's what's ultimately going to be uh, coming out of you. This text is teaching us that we have to consume the word, that we have to marinate in the word. And if we'll do that in community, we'll help each other to fully uh, grow up in Christ because we'll be teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Now, he's already said this before the end of chapter uh, one, that Paul himself, he preaches in such a way uh, that he's teaching every man with all wisdom so that he may present them perfect in Christ. And now he's saying that's not just the preacher's responsibility that in this resurrection life, we're all in this thing together and we're supposed to let the word dwell in us richly to such an extent that we're in our conversations, teaching and admonishing one another and using hymns of praise, the, the songs of the saints to encourage one another as we have grace in our hearts based upon what God has done for us. My brother and my sister, it's not enough for you to just eat the word every now and then. It needs to be your daily diet because whatever you put in you is going to come out of you. We're Our hearts are just like computers. If you put garbage in, garbage is going to come out. This text is saying that the resurrected crowd knows how to let the peace rule in their hearts, knows how to let the word of Christ richly dwell in their hearts. But then look at what he says here in verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So finally, he comes down to the bottom line, to the basic practical implications of all of this. And that is that whether it's in word or deed, whether it's in attitude or actions, whatever we do as Christians, we ought to do it in such a way that it accurately reflects the identity and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he uses this word, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's not just like how sometimes we pray. We say a whole bunch of carnal things and then just slap as a tagline on the end in the name of Jesus. We're not talking about that. We're talking about when we see this word name, it's talking about identification as well as authority. It's talking about uh, designation as well as authentication. The, the, the idea is you need to show yourself to be a Christian in all that you do. If you've been raised with Christ, do what you do in his name. It's very interesting that uh, in these last couple of years, there's some luxury brands that have fallen in disrepute within the communities of color. Prada, Gucci, as well as Burberry have made some tremendous mistakes in some of their fashion shows where they have depicted 
African-American people in certain lights and they have had boycotts against that brand name because that brand name has shown itself not to necessarily be for all people. But I know a name that every tongue is going to have to confess. Every knee is going to have to bow to. And if you're identified by that name, there ought to be something different about your wardrobe, not, not the suit you wear, not the dress that you uh, sashay in, but in your attitudes as well as your actions, because his name is above all names and his name is worthy to be praised. Why should we do all of this? Why should we put on this new man? Why should we learn how to forgive? Why should we let the peace of Christ and the word of Christ dwell in us richly? If you've been paying attention, it's been sort of interspersed without within this whole text. Because if you look back at chapter three, verse 12, where we started verse 12, it says, the reason we do this is because we've been chosen. We're, we've been set apart and we're loved by God. That's verse 12. But not only that, we've been forgiven. That's what he said. Forgive as you have been forgiven. We've been chosen. We have been set apart. We're holy unto God. We're loved by God. We've been forgiven by God. He's placed us in his body and he's given us grace down in our hearts. So in light of that, how can we not but reverence his name by our attitudes and our actions and do things that give honor and glory to that name. It's very interesting. Uh, the other week, I believe it was on the week of the 15th, the, the Arizona Cardinals and the Buffalo Bills, two football teams were playing and it came down to the last few seconds. The Arizona Cardinals had the ball and they put up what is known as a Hail Mary. That is a last ditch effort with second, seconds on the clock. They just threw the ball into the end zone, hoping that their receiver in the end zone would be able to catch the ball. And lo and behold, a receiver named DeAndre Hopkins, even though he was surrounded by three defenders, he jumped up and caught the ball in the midst of all of those defenders. Now, here's where I bring it up. As fascinating as the catch was, it probably will be the play of the year in terms of the NFL. What struck me is very simply that when he went up and he caught the ball, he was wearing a glove that had the Nike symbol on it. And because of his activity, because of his behavior right there, uh, catching that ball in the midst of those defenders, the, uh, the stats say that that one picture, that one catch and the picture of that catch has generated $5.7 million worth of brand recognition for Nike. He's not even signed up for Nike, but because of his actions, Nike got $5.7 million worth of brand recognition. I point that out because I know somebody that is better than DeAndre Hopkins. I know somebody who conquered death, hell, and the grave. And because of that, his name is above every name. But here's my point. If you bear that name, if you call yourself a Christian, you ought to bring honor to that name. You ought to enhance that name. We ought to make that name more famous in our family, in our community, in our work situation. How can I do that, Pastor? By making sure you're dressed right. And I'm not talking about outwardly, I'm talking about inwardly. Have you learned how to put on a heart of compassion? Have you learned how to be thankful in your heart for all that God has done for you? And have you learned that ultimately it's all about him? It's not about you, it's about his name. And because of who he is and what he's done, we can give thanks through him to God our Father. Thanks to him for our forgiveness. Thanks to him for our peace. Thanks to him for community. And thanks to him that he has clothed us in his righteousness. If you're here today and you're watching, I want to challenge you. First of all, if you don't know Christ, if you have never opened your heart to receive the love of Christ, the forgiveness that Christ offers, now is the time. Today is your day. 
the, the good news is that unlike Prada, Burberry, and Gucci, he's not going to disrespect anybody. Wherever you are and whoever you are, he'll accept you as you are so that he can make you into what he designed you to be. He'll take the old grave clothes of your old lifestyle, your old habit off, and he'll give you a brand new life. If you're already a Christian, I want to challenge you because this text is really for Christians. If you have been raised with Christ, there's a certain lifestyle that attaches to that. It's a lifestyle that manifests itself in compassion and kindness and humility and learning how to forgive other people. And if you're having trouble with that, it could be that maybe you need to go back to square zero. This last example, and I'll let you go. When I was uh, interning between my first and second year of law school, I interned with a lawyer up in Chicago. In order to go into court and to go past uh, the, the bar where only attorneys and prosecutors and judges are allowed to go, you have to be dressed right. You have to have on a, a suit, you have to have on a tie. And so I had a suit and tie and my mentor had to be in two places at once. I had not passed the bar but I was dressed for the part. And he said, listen, just go into that courtroom and ask for a continuance on my behalf. They've seen you with me before. They've seen you in this courthouse before. Just go in there, ask for a continuance, and then I'll be there shortly. So here I am dressed as an attorney. I went in and I went past that designated place and tried to address the judge. But Somebody wisely recognized that just because he's dressed like an attorney doesn't mean he's an attorney. And he, the prosecutor objected, said, Your Honor, is this gentleman an attorney? Show us your bar card. A bar card is what you get when you are a registered attorney that proves that you have passed the bar. I didn't have one of those. They kicked me out of that class, kicked me out of that courtroom. Listen. I was dressed the part, but I hadn't passed the bar. Now, if you still are having trouble forgiving other people, you have trouble letting go of things, you don't have a heart of compassion, you don't have humility, I need you to go back to square zero. Maybe you haven't passed the bar yet. Maybe you haven't come to the cross yet. And I want to challenge you today to let go of all of the other things that you think give life significance and recognize it's only one name. There's only one name that has been given whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. And if you know him, if you've been forgiven by him, then you'll, I'm not saying it'll be easy, but you'll have the capacity to forgive other people because the forgiven are forgiving. If you can't do that, now's the time to examine your relationship with Christ. I pray today that you'll learn how to put on not only the wardrobe of the redeemed, but even the full armor of God so that you can stand strong in these last and evil days. Let me pray for you as I let you go today. Gracious God, our Father, thank you for allowing us to be partners with you in ministry. Thank you for raising us up. And I pray now that you would help us in these last and evil days to, to, to put on the habits and the character of Christ, that you would help us to live in such a way that people can identify us, not by outward appearance, but by inward disposition as those who belong to you. And I pray if there's someone that does not know you in a personal way, that you would draw them by your loving kindness today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and have a great day. And we look forward to seeing you over this Thanksgiving season.
hard to contain. So I.